All right. Can you hear me okay? Well, welcome to the Alisa's for Gap Basis Governments webinar. I'm Deborah, and uh, also Olivia is here with me somewhere. So uh, let's face it, it's time to put GASB 87 leases back on the front burner. So let's get started. Next slide. Okay, now the best place I think for, for you to start is to view our uh, leases project page in the BARS manual. This is where you'll find all the implementation guidance, uh, you know, accounting and financial reporting, uh, frequently asked questions, uh, links to some really good resources. I know it's a lot, but it's all in one place. So that's the best part about it. Slide. First of all, I want to talk about the timing. You know, initially, GASB 87 was going to be effective for years ending December 31st, 2020 and after. So you would have already implemented. But uh, GASB 95 delayed it to years ending June 30th, 2002 and after. So 18 months, which is, you know, kind of an odd delay, you'd think a year at a time. But this is actually pretty good news. You know, before, local governments like you would have implemented first and followed by the state. Now the state goes first with their June 30th year end before you guys. So, you know, the state's CAFR is gonna be published before you even have to close your books. So uh, they will have implemented six months before you and that always helps. Uh, this one, it is applied retroactively. So for those of you who uh, like to present comparative years, you will have to restate the prior year also. So you restate beginning balances of whatever year is the earliest. Next slide. First thing I want you to do is read and read and read and read some more. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got the statement, GASB 87, and they also published an implementation guide. I think there was about mm, 77 Q and A's in that one and some examples. And then each year afterwards, you know, since there's been this delay, when they publish their annual implementation guide update. So in 2020, there was another a new uh, 12 lease Q and A's, and last year for 2021, there was another 19. Now these are really good. You know, initially that uh, first implementation guide, that was them. That was the Gasby. They were coming up with uh, scenarios and saying, you know, how would it be treated? But these new Q and A's in the implementation guides, those are questions that came from local governments like you. So those are real life examples. So I think they're even better than the implementation guide, you know, the initial one. And also just a couple of weeks ago, Gasby dropped a, an exposure draft for their, what they call an omnibus statement. And I know there's some leases questions, uh, some issues in there too. So be sure and read that also. But um, I think the important thing as you're looking through those, Note how the small changes in facts and circumstances can really change the accounting treatment on a lease. Okay, next slide. Well, accounting principles have changed. GASB 87 is based on the principle that leases are financing of the right to use an underlying asset. And this is a, this is a conceptual change when you think about it. It means that something that just normally it used to be just something that went through your operating statement, just a regular monthly, quarterly, annual payment. Now, this information is going to end up on your statement of position, which is right where the users of your financial statements want it to be. So, next slide. All right, let's talk about the lease definition. Oh, I do get, try to get paragraph references on everything so you can you know, read the, the paragraph in GASB 87. Uh, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to ignore the word lease because um, you don't want to rely on the lease level label. Uh, a lease is a contract that conveys control of the right to use another entity's non-financial asset, uh, which, is, which is a capital asset, as specified in the contract for a period of time in an exchange or exchange-like transaction. And leases can also be embedded in other types of agreements. So keep that in mind too when you're looking for leases. Next slide. Now I'm really gonna pick this apart, the key terms in this. 
in this definition. First of all, you're looking for a contract. Now, a contract might not be written, uh, but it should be legally enforceable. And this is a great time if you happen to have any of those things. I know, especially with older governments, you've been, you know, maybe two cities next to each other. You've probably been doing something for some, since the turn of the last century. You know, you've never had it in writing. But really think about those activities. Maybe it's a lease and maybe it should be in writing. Actually, it should definitely be in writing. And ah, when you do have contracts, please make sure that the form of the contract matches the substance of the agreement. I think too often I get questions about, you know, something, an activity. I say, oh, can I look at the contract? And I go, well, here's what the contract says, but here's what we really do. And that, that shouldn't happen. The contract should reflect what actually happens. So next slide, let's keep going here. Now, a contract that conveys control of the right to use another entity's non-financial asset. Now, control of the right to use, it's distinct from the asset itself. And there are two components. The right to obtain the present service capacity from use of the underlying asset and also the right to determine the nature and manner of its use. You need to have both elements of control to have control of the right to use. And it is possible to have one without the other. In fact, here's an example. Next slide. Okay, in our example, we have a multi-year agreement for portable toilets that allows the vendor to switch out the assets as necessary with comparable ones. The substitution is made several times a year. So is this a lease? Well, yes, this is a lease. So the right to use that underlying asset is distinct from the asset itself. So substitution of that essentially identical asset does not change the control of use. In our second example, we have a city with a multi-year agreement for exclusive use of a facility during regular business hours. In the evenings, a yoga instructor uses the facility, and on Sundays, a church uses the facility. So does the city have control of use in this case? Yes, they do have control. So that control doesn't need to be uninterrupted. They've got control during their regular business hours. Okay, one more example here. City has a multi-year agreement with an individual that allows goats to graze in a city park year round. The agreement does not allow the activity to impede other people's use of the park. So is this one a lease? Nope, this time this one is not a lease because we have to think about what's the underlying asset here. And in this case, it's the land and that goat herder does not have control of the land. So this one is not a lease. Okay, here's our first CPE code word. It is leases. And remember, you have to input them in the same order that they were presented. So your first code word is leases. All right, thank you, Olivia. Let's let's go on and keep picking apart this lease definition. It's a contract that conveys control of the right to use another entity's non-financial asset. So another entity means another legal entity. You don't have to worry about those interdepartmental leases, you know, like between um, internal service funds and other funds. Those are eliminated. Uh, you don't have to worry about blended component units, unless they're actually publishing their own financial statements, and a discreetly presented component unit, that is another entity. I know it's part of your financial reporting entity when you do your financial statements, but it is another legal entity, so you will have to apply the accounting and financial reporting of GASB 87 if there's leases between you and a component unit, a discreetly presented component unit. So, next slide. Okay, a contract that conveys control of the right to use another entity's non-financial asset. 
of course that means a capital asset. It's not things like a, when you investments, things like that. Uh, as specified in the contract, for a period of time in an exchange or exchange-like transaction. Now exchange or exchange-like, that means uh, cases where relatively equal value are exchanged. And you do need to consider all payments when you're thinking about that. I mean, um, think about, oh, like if you rented a, a farmer's a booth at a farmer's market, maybe it's only like $10 or something for the, for the, for the session. But then you have to also remit a, a certain percentage of your gross receipts, maybe 15%, 10, 15%, something like that. If you were just looking at that payment for the booth, you might think, oh, that's not an exchange transaction. But you do need to consider all the payments. In that case, that kind of a transaction, it is an exchange type of transaction. And also, keep in mind that non-cash doesn't necessarily equal non-exchange. I think a, an example I'm thinking of, I know where there's a library district and a city, they, they're right next to each other. Uh, they built new buildings and the, the library has just a fantastic parking lot. And the city said, you know, if you'll let us have about, oh, 16 spots over there, because you know, you know what it's like on court day. We'll let you have this one corner in our city hall. You can have your, your finance to pe people from the library over there in city hall. Well, even though there's no money being exchanged, that is an exchange transaction because they're both exchange equal value. Um, I do know there's, there's no money being exchanged, but maybe in cases like that, it is better to actually pay the rent to each other than to just, but, but that's up to you. That's something, but it is an exchange transaction. So next slide. Oh, we got another example here, Olivia. Okay, in this example, we have a school district pays $10 a year to use a field owned by the city. School district has exclusive use of the land for its various sports activities. And the school district maintains the lawn and they've even placed a portable building on the land to store equipment. So is this one a lease within the scope of GASB 87? Answer here is no, it's not an exchange transaction. So even though the school has control of the underlying asset, it's not an exchange transaction, so it's not a lease. All right, that's a good point. You can have control of use, but not have a lease. Ah, here's, the, here's where we get into the kicker. For a period of time, leases have to be for a period of time, the lease term. Now, obviously, if you're gonna have a financing, you need to have the elements of the financing, and that's, you know, payments over time. And uh, for leases, it's going to include the period during which a lessee has a non cancelable right to use an underlying asset. That's usually, you know, the first period, you know, when you take out a lease. Plus, periods covered by a lessee's or lessor's option to extend the lease. If you're reasonably certain the option will be exercised. And what does reasonably certain mean? Well, I know it is a judgment call and you're going to have to make it and periods covered by the lessee's or lessor's option to terminate the lease if you're reasonably certain the option will not be exercised. So you see this comment, okay, the lease is for five years plus two options to extend for another five years each. You're gonna have to exercise judgment and okay, will those options be extended or not? Now, a lease term excludes periods for which both the lessee and the lessor each have the option to terminate or both parties must agree to extend. I think at that point, it's pretty clear, you know, the lease is over and you need a new lease. So, next slide. Ah, another example. Okay, this time we have a county that leases office space at full market value to various nonprofit agencies in support of their programs. The lease terms are for five years and either party can cancel after the first six months with a 30 day notice. So what is the lease term as defined by GASB 87? So it's only six months. So remember Deb told us that if either party can cancel, that's not included in the lease term. So after those first six months, they can both cancel it so that is our lease term. 
This time, a lease has an initial non-cancelable term of five years. After that, the lease will continue on a month-to-month -month basis, and both the lessor and lessee have the option to cancel with a 30-day notice. The lessee has operated a successful enterprise at this location for years and plans on selling it at a significant gain when he retires in seven years. What is our lease term this time? Well, it's only five years. Even though it's likely that those options will be exercised and they'll continue the lease because they both have the option to cancel, that's not included in the lease term. Okay, let's talk about exclusions. I mean, do you have to account for every last little lease under the requirements of GASB 87? Well, no, there's certain things that are excluded. And I think the most popular one has to be short-term leases. That's one that at the beginning of the lease has a maximum possible term of 12 months or less, including any options to extend. For example, it was just, you know, you just had a month-to-month -month lease. And this is based on the form of the agreement, not those probabilities. It's just what is in writing. Next slide. Here's a good example of that. Okay, so our lease has a non cancelable term of six months with five options for the lessee to extend for 12 months at a time. The lessee is a startup company and it's unlikely those options will be exercised. So is this one a short-term lease or not? No, our maximum possible term here, regardless of whether the lessee will exercise those extensions or not, is five and a half years. But the lease for the accounting purposes, the lease term is only six months. So even though it's not a short-term lease, it's possible to have a lease with a term of less than 12 months. So yeah, that's the point is that you look at the form of the contract to determine if something is short-term or long-term. And when you're actually capitalizing and doing the accounting, that's when you've got to start considering those probabilities of you know, what's going to happen. Okay. so. Let's talk about ah, some more exclusions. Uh, contracts that transfer ownership, what we used to call capital leases. There, we're gonna call them installment sales now. So if the title to the asset transfers to the lessee at the end of the contract, you're gonna report that as a finance purchase by the lessee or a finance sale by the lessor. So that's what they mean when they say that capital leases are going away. It's not that they go away, you don't call them capital leases anymore. Uh, they're just their finance purchases. Now, if you have a lease that contains a, a purchase option, including a bargain purchase option, don't treat it as a purchase or sale until that option is determined to be exercised. And this does uh, create a few problems here. And now and again, I've seen where uh, someone said, you know, all these years we've been leasing these uh, police vehicles, you know, three years at a time, and we've never bought them. Well, we got to set, we really like them this time. And, you know, we've got some funding with COVID and all that. This time, you know, we've decided we're going to buy them. Well, it's no longer a lease. Now it's a finance purchase and you got to treat it that way in accounting. So you might have to make some adjustments. And I've seen it go the other way too. People say, you know, we lease these golf carts and buy them all the time. Well, on this lease, after about the first six months, we realized, oh, we don't like these ones. It's just not working out. So we've decided we're not going to buy them. Well, now you're going to have to treat it like a lease. In fact, speaking of golf carts, here's an example. Okay, a municipal golf course leases golf carts under a three-year lease agreement, and they'll own the golf carts at the end of the lease term unless it exercises its option to terminate the agreement, which it can do at any time. So is this one a lease or an installment sale? This is a lease. If there was no option to terminate, it would be an installment sale instead. Okay, here is our second CPE code word. Well, it's a number, 2022. So the year that lease accounting is effective.
Okay, let's talk about some more exclusions, things that uh, aren't subject to the accounting under uh, GASB 87. Uh, leases of intangible assets, that's things like mineral rights, patents, software, copyrights, ah, software, such as subscription-based IT arrangements, ah, that's GASB 96. Actually, GASB 96 mirrors 87, and I do know a lot of people are saying, hey, we're just doing them both at the same time, but there's a year's delay on that one. A lease is a biological assets like timber, living plants, and living animals. Uh, keep in mind uh, that we did have a one situation come up when you know someone said, "Oh, I lease my land to a farmer to grow crops," and the first thought was, "Oh, crops! Well, those are living plants. Don't have to worry about that." It's not. It's the land that is being leased. So it doesn't matter what the land is used for. The land in that case is being leased. And of course, land is a capital asset. It's not a biological asset. And uh, I mean, you can understand why leases of biological assets wouldn't be subject to this. I mean, you never really know how long plants or animals are gonna live. So it's hard to be firm on the term on those. Uh, leases of inventory are excluded. And I believe that's the type of inventory that's held for sale. And service concession arrangements. That was in GASB 60, but now that's gonna be GASB 94. Uh, that's um, PPPs, public-private and public-public partnerships and availability payment arrangements. That's GASB 94. Uh, that was effective 2023. Uh, once again, the, the, the accounting and financial reporting pretty much mirrors um, 87 and 96. I've heard maybe a couple people say, oh, I'm just going to do all three at the same time. Or, I don't know. We'll see how that goes. I think we have another example here, right? Oh, yes. Okay, a county leases land to a farmer who has exclusive use of the land to grow co crops. So is this one a lease within the scope of GASB 87? So yes, when we think about the underlying asset here, it's the land not the crops. So this one is a lease within the scope of GASB 87. I gave that one away, Dan. And I knew where I had heard that story somewhere before. Anyway, let's finish up on these exclusions. Assets financed with an outstanding conduit debt. And let's say on your, for some reason, they both have to be reported by the lessor, and that's usually when the, the debt uh, is not able to be paid by the others. Uh, supply contracts, things like power purchase agreements, water agreements, you know, those big um, electricity agreements you have with BPA, that's not a lease. It's only if you're actually uh, uh, using, renting the right to use some underlying uh, power equipment. And certain regulated leases, like the aviation leases between airports and air carriers, uh, those are the only kinds of regulated leases that I've come across that are excluded from uh, GASB 87, the, the ones between airlines, like in the United Airlines and the Port of Seattle, something like that. If you have some other kind of regulated lease, uh, it would be interesting you know, for us to hear about that because so far that's really the only example I've got of something like that. Okay, ah, let's talk about a threshold. I mean, do you really want to account for every last little lease under the GASB 87? So if people are saying, well, I want to set a threshold like I do for capital assets, that, that kind of thing. You know, that's fine. That's allowable. But there are some, it's a little bit tricky. There are some caveats. First of all, don't just arbitrarily set a threshold before you have fully inventoried your leases. Don't just pick something out of a, out of a hat. A lease threshold has to be immaterial for both individual leases and in the aggregate. In fact, Gasby recently had a, a question, a Q&A on that. If you read the implementation guide at 2021, Q&A 5.1, that's where they have this discussion. It's, it's related to capital assets, but it, but it still applies here. Immaterial, both individually and in the aggregate. You wanna analyze both the asset and liability sides of the agreement now. If either side is material, then both sides are material. You're going to record both sides. And keep track of those leases that you exclude because your auditor is going to want to see that. You've got to be able to document that they truly are immaterial in the aggregate. So 
this is a, a, a policy we expect to see in writing. And like I say, keep that in mind, immaterial, individually and in the aggregate. Okay, let's start talking about the accounting and financial reporting for leases. I like this diagram because to me, this one says it all. The financial statement effect, this is where you can really see the conceptual change. Now for the lessee, they're gonna have an intangible asset and a lease liability. Whereas before, you just had payments flowing through your operating statement. Now, in your statement of net position, an intangible asset, it's a, it's a type of capital asset, and a lease liability. And for the lessor, they're gonna have a lease receivable and a deferred inflow. And the lessor continues to report that lease capital asset. This is the, like I said, I think this illustrates the change because you can see over the last 20, 30 years, just think how much leasing and other types of long-term payment arrangements have taken over in, in, in government and in, in the private sector. And that was one of the complaints by uh, serious users of your financial statements, people who really analyze the financial statements. They're saying, you know, it's hard for us to predict future cash flows, which is what they want to be able to do when they look at your statement of position. They said, it's hard for us to do that when there's all this activity that's flowing through the operating statement that never hits the balance sheet. So that's why you're seeing things like leases and those other, um, under GASB 94, those other long-term payment arrangements. That's why you're seeing them move to your statement of position. Next slide. Now, then in subsequent years, that lessee is gonna amortize that intangible right to use asset over the shorter of its use for life or its lease term. And then hopefully you're not leasing something for, for uh, longer than its useful life. And then for the liabilities, the lessee is gonna reduce that lease liability by the lease payments. The lessor is gonna reduce the lease receivable by, by the lease payments and then recognize the revenue from that deferred inflow, inflow over the uh, lease term in a systematic and rational manner. We'll, we'll talk about that and the lesser continues to depreciate the least asset. I mean, unless it's something like land, something like that. Next slide. Okay, this lease liability for the lessee, this lease liability, it's gonna be measured at the present value of future lease payments. And that includes you know, the regular lease payments, the fixed payments, variable, variable payments that are based on the index, reasonably certain residual guarantees, any of the payments. That's going to affect the lease liability. And that intangible lease asset is going to be measured at the value of that lease liability plus any prepayments, plus any initial direct costs that are necessary to place the asset in use, just like any other capital asset. And so I want you to think about those two. You can see they're not necessarily going to be the same. I think a lot of people think, okay, okay, if I've got my lease liability, that's my lease asset. Well, not necessarily. So keep that in mind. Next slide. For the lessor, the lease receivable is going to be measured at the present value of future lease payments, including fixed payments, variable payments based on an index, reasonably certain residual guarantees, the same things. And the deferred inflow is going to be measured at the value of the lease receivable plus any upfront payments that relate to a future period. So once again, you can see those two numbers may not necessarily be the same. Okay, well, we were talking about present value. It's like, oh, oh well, we need a discount rate. And here's where I, can, I think this has been probably the most difficult part, I think, so far of implementing GASB 87. You know, leases are a pit, principal interest time, Okay, we've got to have a discount rate. We need interest. But we're kind of going about this financing concept in reverse. You know, usually when you go out and finance something, you know how much you pay for it. You know what the interest rate is, and that's going to determine the payments, right? Now we're going in reverse. We've got the payments. We know how long they're going to go for. We've got to have a reasonable interest rate so that we can come up with the principal, the present value of those future payments. You can see I got a lot of references here, a lot of paragraph references. And like I say, that's because this is a, probably one of the most difficult things about GASB 87. The least receivable or the liability payments should be discounted using the rate the lessor charges the lessee. 
Now that may be implicit on the contract because honestly, how many leases have an interest rate written in the contract? Or if the rate cannot be read readily determined, the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. So you can imagine you're, you're the lessor. How in the heck do I know what the lessee's incremental borrowing rate is? You know, there's no rate written in the contract. I can't really figure out an implicit rate. How do I know what the incremental borrowing rate is? Well, Gatsby, they heard you when you complained about this, and so there is an update. If you look in Implementation Guide 2020, Q&A 415, Gatsby said, okay, if it's not practicable to determine the lessee's rate, the lesser may use its own incremental borrowing rate. Now, if it's not practicable, don't doesn't mean you can just use your own incremental borrowing rate in any case at all times. Uh, I think at first people were like, yay, I can just use my rate, less or any rate. Well, the discount rate still has to be reasonable for the specific lease. Because in, in incremental borrowing rate, I want to read you the defini definition here. It's the rate of interest that a borrower would have to pay to finance an asset of the same type over a similar term in the current economic environment and of a similar value as the right of use of intangible assets. So if the rate has to be reasonable for the specific lease at the time of inception. So like I say, you can't just pull something out of a hat. Next slide. This is our third CPE code word. It is project. So remember, you have to input these in the correct order at the end of the training. So your third code word is project, like our leases project page on our website. Okay, we're going to talk about present value. I do want to make one comment. I have come across um, instances where I mean, you can just tell the discount rate was not reasonable. We had a couple where um, they ended up with negative amortization, meaning at the, the early years of a lease with an increasing, you know, a monthly payment, the um, the payment wasn't even enough to cover the interest. So you would actually, it's sort of like a like what a loan shark would do, you know, that the balance due was growing instead of you know, going down as they made payments. And gosh, it was happening for years and years. You could tell that's not a reasonable rate. So. It does have to be reasonable for the individual contract. Now, Excel does have a present value function that you can use. Also, I heard my favorite program, T-Value, is still out there, available for use. And I'm going to give you an example here so you can make sure you know how to use it. Just get out your Excel for Dummies book and you can figure it out. Now, the example I have, we've got a 60-month lease, $1,000 a month for three at 3%, 3 and incidentally, this is just an example. I actually got it from a GFOA. I have this, uh, this fear that come early 2023 when auditors go out to audit, they're going to come across all these leases and everything is 3%. And they're going to say, well, because SAO said in their, in their webinar it was 3%. No, this is just an example, okay? You do have to have your, you know, pick your own interest rate. And you can see, so give this one a try. If it's 60 months, $1,000 a month at 3%, a discount rate, uh, that's 55,791. And the interesting thing about this, next slide, whether you do it in a lump sum like that, or if you schedule out your payments and discount each one individually, you should get exactly the same answer to the penny. So that's one way that I, I know that I'm doing it right and that I understand how to use the Excel function. Uh, this is helpful because, you know, rarely I think as you get into the more complex leases, I think rarely are you going to see something where it's just, you know, the same dollar amount for, you know, every month until the end of the lease. Things happen in leases. Not only do you, you know, if they, especially for several years, you want to increase the rent, but things happen. You know, people, oh, there was a rat infestation, so you want to give them a break for a couple of months on their rent. You're going to have to know how to make those changes to present value to recalculate those. Next slide. Okay, we've got some numbers to work with, so let's look at the accounting. Uh, one thing, I don't, don't expect this kind of symmetry in your accounting. This was uh, the example we're using, but you know, the lessor and the lessee don't necessarily end up with the same result. What if the lessor based their, their calculation of the lease receivable, maybe they had an implicit rate from the contract, 
and maybe the less lessee used their incremental borrowing rate and it was different. So don't think that you're gonna, you know, both have the, the same, start with the same balance or you have to call up the other party and say, okay, what did you get for the present value? No, you don't have to do that. And once again, also, I don't think you can always expect the least receivable or deferred inflow to be the same or the least asset or the least liability to start out the same, but uh, that's the number we came up with in our example. So let's look at how the accounting goes. Now for the initial recording of the, the lease, uh, the lessor records the least receivable and that deferred inflow and the lessee records a lease asset, that's the right to use asset, the capital asset, and the lease liability. Now then, uh, for subsequent years, and I'm, I'm showing like the first year's totals of payments, although you will probably have these entries post once a month, uh, the lessor got 12,000 in cash over the year. Part of that reduces the lease receivable and part is interest revenue. Then the rest of that lease revenue comes from recognizing that deferred inflow. In this case, we did it um, straight line. That's why there's a slight difference between the you know, least receivable reduction and the deferred inflow reduction. But people say, well, do I have to do it straight line? I'd like to reduce my deferred inflow the same as my least receivable is reducing. So they would stay the same. Yeah, you could do that. That's a, uh, that's a uh, consistent, that's a rational manner, right? Uh, just whatever way you choose, be consistent. No, no, no flipping back and forth. And for the lessee, as they pay out the 12,000, that reduces the lease liability and there's some interest expense. And then the rest of the expense comes from the amortization of that uh, lease asset, the right to use asset. Next slide. And one thing I wanna point out now, for the lessor, this treatment is the same in, in governmental funds or at the government, government wide level. But for lessees, even though at the government wide level, it's what we just looked at, at the governmental fund level, remember this is the financing. So when you initiate that lease, you've got capital outlay, just like you have for a capital lease now. You have capital outlay expense, expenditure, and then other financing source in governmental funds. And then as you make the payments, it's debt service, debt service principal and interest. So a little bit different treatment in governmental funds for lessees. So next slide. Now let's talk about remeasurement, because like I say, leases are all about change. Things can happen where you have to remeasure that initial lease liability or lease asset and everything, but only under certain conditions. Now you're going to remeasure the lease liability or receivable, and only if it's a significant change. But for these, uh, in these cases, I got change in the lease term. Let's say, oh, you thought that someone was going to, you know, take both of those five-year extensions, and then the owner, you know, they went out of business. So obviously, okay, that that last five years is going to go away. Uh, change in the likelihood of a residual value guarantee that would just be for the lessee. Uh, change in the likelihood of a purchase option. We were talking about that earlier. A uh, change in estimated amount for payments already included. Change in interest rate the lessor charges. Remember, we're not talking about the discount rate yet and a contingency resolve for variable payments. In fact, one thing you don't see on this list is a change in the discount rate. You don't go back and remeasure simply because you've had a change in your discount rate, maybe your incremental borrowing rate change. You don't go back and make a change. But now if you're remeasuring for one of these other reasons, that would be the point to look at the discount rate and say, hey, has it changed enough that I wanna consider that and incorporate that into my remeasurement? but you don't remeasure just solely for a change in the discount rate. And another thing, remember I was talking about that one lease that had the negative amortization. Another thing you don't do, let's say um, someone missed a couple of payments, you're still charging interest, right? And they're still paying interest, owing interest, let's say. You don't add that interest to the lease liability or the receivable. Always keep accrued interest separate. I'm making a point of this because I've seen some demonstrations of some lease software where they were, when uh, interest was accruing and payments weren't being made, they were adding that interest to the principal. That's not the way we do it in debt service, right? No, keep your principal and interest separate. Next slide. Ah, let's talk about some bars coding here. Now, interest income 
it's always going to be a non-operating revenue. So it's always going to be bars 3614, whatever. The least revenue in governmental and proprietary funds, it's only it's only going to be a bars 34, whatever. If the leasing is the primary operation of a fund. So like in ports, you could say that leasing was the primary operation. I've heard of some uh, facilities type funds where you've got buildings you're leasing up. That would probably be the primary operation of a fund. But I think it's more likely that leasing is not going to be, for most funds, a, a primary operation of that fund. So in proprietary funds, it's going to be non-operating revenue, a 362, and then also for governmental funds. It's for leases that aren't tied to a specific operation or function, you know, that, that are infrequent in nature. Next slide. I want to point out, I do want to discuss again the thing about operating versus non-operating because, you know, Initially, when all this started, we talked again we, and we said, you know, what about it, entities like ports or funds where, you know, leasing is the primary operation? Wouldn't the interest also be operating revenue? And Gatsby said, well, yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. But then we noticed in the, the latest implementation guide 2021, uh, look at question 4.13. And it says, um, you know, if the principal ongoing operation of a business type activity or an enterprise fund is leasing, should interest revenue related to leases be reported as an operating revenue? Well, before Gasby was leaning to yes, and now they say no, absolutely not. And I've kind of paraphrased the, um, the explanation there. It's, it's pretty lengthy, but like what they're saying is, yeah, although leases are being accounted for like financings, they're not really financings, and that governments are not in the business to finance, so it's going to be not operating revenue. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about some of your note disclosures. Uh, for lessors, you give a general description of the leasing arrangements. Uh, you need to disclose the total amount of inflows recognized in the reporting period from leases and from variable payments not included in the lease receivable. So they, they want to know your total lease revenues if it's not apparent. Um, if lease payments secure your debt, then you're going to need to disclose the terms and conditions of the lessee's options to terminate the lease or abate payments, and uh, you could understand why a creditor would want to know that. And if the lessor's principal ongoing operations are leasing assets, like you ports, you disclose a schedule of future payments, so principal and interest, for the next five years and in five-year increments after that. And then on the lessee side, Once again, a general description of the leasing arrangements. Now, how general is general? I had one person say, uh, let's see, we have leases, we lease things from five to 50 years, from $700 to so much per month. Maybe that's a little bit too general. Try to group your, you know, your, your disclosures into, you know, maybe various types of, 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 of leased assets, you know, equipment, buildings, things like that. So, not too general, but you don't have to describe every individual lease. The amount of assets recorded under leases and the related accumulated amortization disclosed separately from other capital assets, and I'll show you an easy way to do that. Principal and interest payments to maturity for each of the five subsequent years and five-year increments after that, just like any other long-term liability. Commitments for leases before commencement of the lease term and uh, losses from impairments and related changes to the lease liability. That's just like with any other capital asset. Next one. Now, here's what I meant. Now, here for you lessees, here's a simple way to, explode, to disclose, you know, the, the leased assets and the accumulated amortization separately. You can include it right in your capital assets note. Just make sure they are listed separately in that table. Um, you could also do your own separate note for leases. That's fine either way. And then for the uh, the principal and interest payments, you know, in five year increments and then five year after that, I've had people say, you know, I want to have a separate note. Other people say I'm going to include this information in my long term liability note. Either way is fine. You just kind of have the leasing information separate from everything else. Okay, next. Ah, here's what I think you really want to know. What are your auditors going to be looking for when they come out to audit this stuff? in early 2023. Unless, of course, your year end is 6.30, then they'll be there earlier. Uh, the most important thing is they want to see the documentation of your system of accounting and controls. 
the auditors don't want to have to slog through every last lease recalculating everything they want to know that you've got a good system and that's really what is important in fact i think we have some uh, on our there's a link on our project page for some implementation plan resources um, a good system is a lot easier for us to audit of course and it works well for you also so document that system well and you do need a system people say well what do you mean a system well, one person said, you know, all I've got is my copier leases, so I've got a piece of ledger paper and I got a, you know, some adding machine tape on it. Okay, that's her system that probably works for her. If you're an entity that's got, you know, 500 leases, you're probably going to need a more automated system. I have seen some people um, modify their, their debt systems and their capital asset system or develop their in-house systems or buy, use Excel, whatever it is. You know you're going to have to develop it to meet your needs and it's going to meet, meet to meet your needs over time and all these changes that can that leases can go through auditors are going to want to see your implementation plan hopefully you know you have a written plan they're going to want to know your process for determining an appropriate discount rate and once again hopefully that is a written policy uh, your process for determining an appropriate threshold, another important written policy. They're going to see your complete population of leases, including short-term leases, anything else excluded, anything that fell below the threshold, because they need to evaluate those and see that those things truly are not material. Next slide. They might consider reviewing your vendor activity and revenue accounts for potential leases, you know, recurring monthly payments, quarterly, annual, and uh, those types of even big, you know, uh, construction contracts. Are you leasing any, uh, like, vehicles and things? Do you have any um, easements, maybe temporary easements in those contracts? They're going to be looking for things like that. Uh, they're going to test the lesser and lessee accounting to determine that financial statement amounts are fairly stated. I mean, there will be some testing of leases. And if for governmental funds, they're going to look for that correct recognition under modified accrual that we were talking about. And they'll closely review the restatement of beginning balances of assets and liabilities. I've had uh, at least one person say, you know, my net change to, um, to net position was nothing because the, uh, the, the lease assets and the deferred inflows equal. So I don't really have to have a restatement. Yes, you do. If you have restated assets and liabilities even if it's by the same amount that is a restatement and it will be looked at and of course they'll look at your note disclosures to make sure they're in compliance with gap okay this is our final cpe code word summer so remember they have to be in the correct order when you go to complete your cpe survey at the end so this is your last code word summer We have some questions. Any good questions we could answer? We have a couple questions asking again about the reference to materiality from the implementation guide. Was that the reference to thresholds? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have to flip, have to, let me. That was a question in the most recent implementation guide. I've been flipping back through some slides here to find that one. Because, you know, materiality, that's a judgment call. And I do want to, yeah, I have a good example. That was implementation guide 2021, uh, Q&A 5.1. And I do have an excellent example from the state of Washington. They fully inventory their leases. Incidentally, the state of Washington is so large, if they were in the Fortune 500 bid, they'd be in the top 200. This is a large entity. They inventoried all their leases and they found out if they had a threshold of $500,000 per lease, lease don't fall over, that would only exclude about, I think, about 4% of their total lease dollars. They were still capturing over 95% of their lease dollars. See, they have met the materiality in the aggregate, and they do have to save those those excluded leases for their auditors. In the aggregate, they'll only be excluding, you know, three, 4% of their total leases. They're capturing everything else. 
that's a good materiality judgment in my in my opinion any other questions um i'm checking we have a lot of specific questions yeah we'll have to uh, kind of probably review the detail on those yes so i'm seeing if we have um let's cover the how to determine reasonably certain um there's a lot of questions on that because i know that one is auditor and accountant judgment yeah you need professional judgment if you're looking for a checklist for professional judgment there isn't one uh you do have to you have to know the entity that you're dealing with and honestly when you made that lease when you said, okay, it'll be for the first five years plus so many options to extend. The reason you did it is you really do expect them to, to, uh, to take those options, right? So really, I think it's, uh, there's more, there has to be a greater reason for excluding those additional periods. But once again, that's what professional judgment's all about. Or any governments that have early implemented, have we found any shortfalls or good things that they have done? One I have a port was pretty simple. Um, I yeah, would have to look at the audit results. They don't report audit results to me. And yeah, I haven't had any like serious questions brought. I don't, don't believe there was any findings. But they were also, I think, relatively simple implementations and that's why they did them early. Yes, looks like that is all of the general questions. We will answer the specific ones. Uh, we'll get back yes. to you guys on this. Yes, we just want to make sure we get all the details for those since those are where we run into problems. All right, so. Did you have that last slide? Do that last okay. slide because there's our contact information. And please start sending those leases questions to the help desk. We want to get this information into our database or you can contact uh, either Olivia or I directly with your questions. All right, with that, we will um, close out our webinar for today. When I turn off the webinar, you will get a pop-up with the survey. The first two questions will be for our feedback. The next four are for your code words that do need to be entered in in the correct order thank you for attending today and we hope to see you for our next webinar give us a few months and we will have this up on our website if you'd like to review we do have some backlog on that so thank you everyone for attending today thanks everyone Bye.